Good evening, good evening, and God bless you. Welcome to this, another opportunity for a moment in the Word. I'm excited and I'm delighted that you are staying connected and that you're connected with us tonight. I pray that as a result of our coming together, that it will be beneficial to you from the aspect of giving you a little medicine for your mind and a little strategy for your soul. And so in that regard, I want to say to you that if you are an unsaved person, it is most certainly not difficult for you to meet God. You can meet God uh, right here and now um, by texting Enon Salvation, Enon Salvation to the number 54244. Or you may text Enon Support if you're in need of some kind of assistance during this season, uh, you can text Enon Support to the number 54244, or you may text Enon Prayer or Enon MG, which is mobile giving, mobile giving, you can do that. Or you can go onto our website if you'd like to share in a donation to this ministry. You can do that by going onto our online uh, website, theenonchurch.org, uh, which some of you connected by this mean uh, to us tonight on the YouTube channel. You can do that and go on to the online giving portion and share your tithe offering or uh, your love offering or which, whatever your pleasure is in that regard. Or you can do it by mailing it to us, 3550 Enon Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30349. And again, let me say welcome to all of you who have connected with us tonight. And most certainly we extend a hearty welcome to those persons who perhaps are connecting with us for the very first time or you are a visitor in regards to this virtual connection. Let me say that to you. And now that we have those preliminaries out of the way, I want to also express my gratitude and appreciation to all the people of the Enon Church and our friends alike who thought it enough uh, uh, to share in the celebration on this past Sunday as we celebrated 28 years of serving as pastor and people here at the Enon Church, the E Church, where the E is for excellence. And uh, we endeavor to live Christ, seek the salvation of the unsaved, foster unity of faith, and promote a more excellent way of living. And so I want to thank you for thinking enough of me. It was something that was not planned from my perspective. And really, I hadn't said anything to anybody. And in actuality, no one had said anything to me. So it was a pleasant surprise when I arrived uh, to preach the gospel and was prepared to preach and to minister. And I was asked not to. It was the very first time that I have been asked not to preach. But I understood and I understand now in retrospect why that took place. Thank you so very kindly for sharing and being generous enough to impart to me gifts, calls, monetary gifts, whatever you did, I am very much appreciative. And I realized that it was something that did not necessarily have to be done, but you thought enough of me to do that, and I am most certainly appreciative. And so as we get into the word tonight, I want to call your attention to Psalm number 91, Psalm 91, in verse 1 and 2, and then we'll go to verse 11 and 12. Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2, and then we'll go to verse 11 and 12. And I will be reading from the New Living Transliteration of the Hebrew context. It will most certainly take us to the same doxological and benedictional moment. And as we explore what it says there, I want you to look with me at verse number 1 and 2 and verse 11 and 12. Those who live in the shelter, watch that, of the Most High, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is, watch this, he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. He's my God and I trust him. And then verse 11 and 12, into our reading it says, New Living Transliteration again, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Watch this. He will order his angels 
to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. I listen at that. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot uh, on a stone. I want to tag this text with this thought, a picture of the God of Psalms 91. A picture of the God of Psalm 91. Watch this. Understand this now, ladies and gentlemen. Hear me clearly. Just as there are different words which we use to really describe and depict people and personalities such as father. We use the word such as friend, wife, son. And the Bible uses really uh, different words to describe God for who he is and giving us a glimpse into the nature and the character of God. And so I've often said that there is only one God within the three distinct personality functions within the scheme of humanity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And within the confines of this example of Psalm number 91, where the writer uh, presents for us four different pictures of God, four different pictures of God. And so the Psalm begins, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That's verse one. And so the name of the Most High comes from the Hebrew word Elyon, E-L-Y-O-N, Elyon, which really speaks of God as one who possesses everything. He possesses every solitary thing. That's why when Jesus comes on the scene, he tells us that everything we will need, I will supply all your need, it doesn't say needs, it says need according to his riches and glory. So basically what he's saying is that everything you will ever need comes through God Almighty. Everything you will ever need. That's why there are no needs for the children of God once we have the need of Jesus Christ. Watch this. So it reminds us that God owns it all. And so that really says the paradigm that he wants to be first in our lives because if God is not God over all, he don't want to be God at all because it reminds us in this text that God owns it all. Come on, say that to yourself. God owns it all. And so the next name, the next name, Almighty, or uh, 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 Shaddai, a Shaddai Hebrew speaks of provision, the God who provides. Now, we talked about number one, the God who possesses. Now, the God who provides. He not only possesses, but he will provide for his people what he possesses. Watch that. So it's wonderful to know that God owns everything, but it also is wonderful to know that he wants to provide everything he owns for his people. And understand this, that a lot of times in an analytical sense, God wants to bless us more than we want the blessing. He wants to bless us many times more with what he possess. He wants to provide more than we want the blessing. So he not only uh, the living God, but he also is the giving God. I want you to hear that again. He's not only the living God, but he is the giving God. And so this really is setting the paradigm to give you the picture of the God of Psalms 91. Then we come to verse number two, which says, this I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge and my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. Throughout all of what we've been dealing with, the issues and the ups and the downs, the scale schematics of what has been transpiring, 
with up and down numbers of COVID-19. Understand this, that God is the only safe place and he's the only one that you really can trust in this systematic system that we're really fighting against many times because it's, it's really at a place that it is systemic that we as a people even have been dealing with issues the ups and downs that have been thrust upon us by someone else uh, in this season even because we look at the tail in the tapestry of what has been transpiring within the framework of our communities and many times we look at the systemic laws that have been put in place to set us back instead of going forward but what we have to realize is that Psalm 91 verse 2 declares that I declare about the Lord he alone is my refuge no matter what's going on he is our safe place he is our God and we must always trust him watch this so the word Lord comes from the Hebrew word that means and has been translated Yahweh, 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 Yahweh or Jehovah in the English. And so it's the word God gave to his own people when in speaking of the covenant that he establishes with his people. And so also in verse number two is the term my God, my God, which originates from the word Elohim and means more than one. He's multiple, multiplicity of things to so many. And that means that God can be what I need him to be to me, but he can also be what you need him to be to you. Although we're at different junctures and spaces and places that God is so ubiquitous that he's everything to all of us at the same time. Whatever we need, Elohim, and it means more than one. There are not three gods, watch this, as I stated to you earlier, but there is three members of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So within the framework, just as if the Holy Spirit becomes our babysitter, and he sits there, and, and basically God has allowed Jesus to go back to glory. And so many times when we call on the, the different portions and different parts of God, we call on the wrong part because we don't have to say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, help me. And so it is that the Holy Spirit is the babysitter because he said, if I will not go, the comforter will not come. And so there are many times that the babysitter is there, it's disrespectful to call mama when mama and daddy have left you in the care of the babysitter. So the Holy Spirit is readily available to lead, guide, direct, and even protect us in this season. So when we call on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in a Trinitarian perspective, we are not calling one without the other in a real sense. But there is three distinct personality functions in the scheme of humanity to benefit mankind. And so it is, ladies and gentlemen, God the Father, there are not three gods, but there's only three members of the Trinitarian enterprise to work on the framework of everything we need whenever we need it. To put it together, we see that the all-knowing, all-powerful God who possesses heaven and earth is in a special covenant with us and wants to protect us and not only protect, but he wants to provide for our needs. And so before we even get into the promises contained in this great passage, this psalmist gives us great confidence in God. He says that God possesses all, God can provide all, and God will protect you through all of whatever you go through. And so ladies and gentlemen, when we look at verse number 11 and 12, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. That means that no, there's no stumbling. There's no blockage. There's nothing because every roadblock, really many times we have to be analytical about all the trials and tri tribulations that we face. 
Every roadblock that you faced in your life was not put there to block you. Some of them were put there to bless you because it's all a part of the paradigm of God. Watch this now. Watch what he says because when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he retaliated against Satan's statement with the word of God. And that's really what's going to keep us, the word of God. Because when you look at Luke chapter 4, verse number 3, New Living Transliteration, the devil said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become a loaf of bread. And, but Jesus answered, watch this, no. And then he says in verse 4, the scripture says, please understand that people do not live by bread alone. We do not live by bread alone. Then guess what? Then the devil said, in effect, why don't you fall down and worship me right now? Isn't it strange how the devil is always trying to give us what's already ours? <laughs> but Jesus told him, watch this, because if God possesses everything and wants to provide everything for us, then there's nothing the devil owns that he can give us. Watch this. But the scripture says you must, he says in verse number eight, and uh, in verse number eight, Luke chapter four, he says in the New Living Transliteration, the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Every time the devil came up with something, Jesus turned the word back, on around, back around on him. Always know that God's word is what's going to give you the defense mechanism that you need to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now watch this. So the next, uh, the, the next the devil tried to lure Jesus into jumping off a high point of the temple. He quoted scripture, which he took out of context. He will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will uphold you. Watch this. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. That's what he says in verse number 10 and 11. But watch this. The devil tried to use this verse to say that, that Jesus could recklessly, watch this, test the Lord without consequences. And that's what Satan always wants to do. He wants to, he wants us to move from dependence on God to independence from God, but he failed. Watch this. But Jesus brought it back into context by saying the scripture also says that you must not test the Lord your God. Verse 12 of Luke 4, he says, but God in saying that we should go out and unnecessarily endanger our lives. But these verses of Psalm number 91 are really saying is that God has a work that he will do in your life. And guess what? He will do it. And until he is done, you are indestructible. Man, good God from Zion. That's what I want to get to you tonight. I couldn't wait to get to that point that God is saying, I don't care what happened to you. I've given you a promise that I have possessions of everything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and they even that dwell therein. You even belong to God. He's saying, I've got all of the cattle among a thousand hills. They belong to me and I want to provide for you like never before. I want to get you a blessing that more so than you want the blessing. But guess what? No matter what comes against the possessions and the blessing and me providing for you, you are indestructible. Come on, say that to yourself. I am indestructible. I dare you to say it to yourself. I am indestructible. No weapon formed against me will be able to prosper against the possessions and powers and prevailing promises of Jesus Christ. Watch this here. I am indestructible. I am indestructible. I am indestructible. You can't stop what God has already started. That's what I want to say to you. On the other hand, you shouldn't foolishly test the Lord. Don't go out and test the Lord because guess what? Whatever you're going through is testing you, 
you're not testing God. And no matter what you face, it's not testing God. He knew that you were going to go through everything you're going through. But he provided a means to say to you that with everything you're going through, I'm going to bring you out victorious. You will win. Come on, tell somebody you will win. We see this illustrated in the story of the Apostle Paul when he was shipwrecked. He went uh, to warm himself at the fire where a venomous snake, snake, a venomous snake fastened his hand on Paul's arm. And guess what Paul did? He just shook it off. Come on, I'm trying to tell somebody today, no matter what you're going through, no matter how dark it, shake it off. Come on, somebody tell somebody, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. If, if we were in church like we used to be, and I got to this point, I'll tell you, rock them and shake them, shake them and rock them. Listen, shake it off. He wasn't affected by the venom because God wasn't done with him. I'm going to tell you that again. He was not affected by the venomous poison of the snake because God was not done with him. Can I tell you something? God is not done with you. You better embrace this word today. As I seek to give you a little medicine for your mind and a little strategy for your soul, God is not done with you. So here's what I want you to know. So don't worry about it. Know that God will be with you until he has completed his work. Somebody, he will finish what he started. That's what I want to leave you with today. He will finish what he started and God is not done with you. I want to tell you that God is not done with you. You can rest assured that God will provide. And I, as I've given you some pictures of the God of Psalm 91, you better hold on and embrace it. And I want to challenge you to read Psalm 119, Psalms 37, and read Psalm 91 in its entirety. And let God speak to your life and let him speak peace to you to know that no matter where you find yourself, God is not done. If God has given you a promise and it looks like it's dumber than dead, go back and dig it up. If it's dumber than dead, dig it up and watch God deliver that to your door because God is not done with you. Hold on, you shall reap if you faint not. Please know that God is not done with you.